I am pleased to be joined at the World Oil and Gas Week by Simon Thompson, the Chief Executive Officer of Can Energy, the oil and gas exploration and development company. Hello, Simon, and thank you for joining Hi. us today. Now, the company has a wide portfolio concentrated in three geographical regions, Northwest Europe, the Mediterranean and the Atlantic margin. Mm. Now, your core development assets are in the North Sea, so I'd like you to give me an update on your operations there. Sure. We've got um, two key assets in the, in the North Sea in terms of development. So one is the Kraken field and one is the Catcher field. Um, uh, and when we entered those, we wanted to have a sufficiently large position so that it would be material for us as a group going forward, provide cash flow, fund not only reinvestment in the North Sea, but also our ongoing exploration efforts elsewhere in the world. Both of those are on track. Um, the developments will come to First Oil in each case in 2017 and provide cash flow so that we can continue to be a self-funding vehicle as we go forward. We've got strong partnerships um, in the region. And, and actually what they have formed is a core around which we have added exploration acreage and other opportunities. So we're quite focused players in the North Sea, both in the UK actually and also in Norway, where we have the Scarfell um, discovery, where again we've built an exploration position around it. So there is still a lot of value in the North Sea because some mm. people are questioning it. Uh, the uh, North Sea as an operating environment, obviously complex uh, technology is required there. It's also mm. a competitive environment, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I think, yes, there is still value for the right kind of assets. Um, it's like anywhere in the world. Um, you've got to go into something that is going to be, um, that's going to survive swings in the cycle. Um, in the case of the North Sea, obviously, as you say, there is a, a relatively high cost environment and there is a lot of historic infrastructure, uh, historic fields, and they tend to be higher cost. What we've purposely done is gone into uh, new field developments. Um, uh, in, in each case, it's an FPSO development. Uh, so um, the production costs are relatively low. What that means is that even in the current oil price environment, uh, those remain attractive to us. Uh, in each case, the average production costs uh, for us, for both of those fields on peak production, will be about $20 a barrel. And when you look at it in that context, therefore, um, they make sense for us, even now with the decline in the oil price going forward. And indeed, we see a lot of opportunity in the North Sea in terms of um, additional exploration and discrete um, development and or production interests. But you have to pick and choose. Where you also see opportunity at the moment is in Senegal. Mm. Okay, uh, in Senegal you have a forty percent interest in three offshore uh, blocks. Now you have said previously that the discoveries are world class. Now tell mm. us about the potential and the work you are doing there. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, world class in the sense that um, our discovery, um, the second discovery, we made two discoveries last year. The second discovery is called the Shelf Play, um, was the largest oil discovery in the world last year, um, and has we believe the potential for more upside. Um, why is it world class? Because we've opened up the basin. Um, we currently see five additional prospects, 15 additional leads on top of that. We're acquiring 3D um, seismic as we speak um, over um, another part of the acreage where we haven't already got 3D. Um, and we're able to take advantage of a uh, lower cost drilling environment um, to help us in a program which has just commenced. So we're drilling three wells back to back firm now, um, plus possibly another three wells uh, at the back of that, depending on how results go. So I think for all those good reasons, it is indeed world class. It's something that we and our partners are getting after, and we see a lot of value in it. And that's why Senegal is the place where you are currently focusing mm. most of your uh, exploration budget. Yeah, uh, because um, we see on the block currently around about a billion barrels gross um, wrist resource potential. You know, that's material, that's world class in anybody's reckoning, whether you're a small company or a large company. Uh, I think Senegal is a, an attractive place to do business. Um, it has a deep water port, um, uh, one of the largest in West Africa. Um, it is a, a, a stable environment. Um, we have great cooperation from the government. We're very enthusiastic in terms of you know, the discoveries we've made, but also the fact we're delivering on our promises and we're following on and we're in less than a year since the discoveries embarking on an ambitious appraisal and further exploration program. Now, tell me about the work uh, the group is doing currently uh, to ensure it's still delivering value in the low price environment. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it comes back to the point I made earlier. I mean, there are assets that are 
attractive um, in high oil prices environment and unattractive in low oil price environment. That's a combination of the assets itself, um, the technology required to extract hydrocarbons from it, but also the fiscal environment within which it fits. As a company, what we've tried to do is focus on those areas that have attractive fiscal terms, recognizing the risk of whatever you're doing, uh, relatively stable regimes, and are not, um, if you like, um, unconventional in the sense that um, they are high cost extraction um, areas. So we are conventional explorers. Um, we're exploring in areas where the fiscal terms result in attractive economics, even in the current oil price environment. And we're very focused in that respect. And you know, as a company, we've always kept ourselves small. Um, uh, we've always tried to ensure that um, our headcount and our GNA reflects that, um, so that um, we don't feel that we have um, more than we need in terms of our exploration. And I think when you know that the oil industry is a cyclical industry, you need to design yourself like that so that you can survive these downturns. And this work uh, is enough to protect your strong financial uh, position, your self-funding business. I mean, it's, it's, it's key in terms of uh, what's attractive about the group. Yeah, it's absolutely key. I mean, you, you know, what we've um, put... So the history of the company is to um, monetize success and actually return to shareholders. So over the last 10 years, we've returned $4.5 billion to shareholders. Um, we purposefully shrunk ourselves down to a smaller vehicle to try and grow again. But we've done that with a view to uh, longevity, so we have what we call a balanced proposition. On the one hand, cash and future cash flow, and on the other hand, the exploration opportunities, a number of wells, year on year, can operators that can, if they are successful, like Senegal, provide shareholders with you know, large capital um, potential. Maybe a nagging concern for the company, this uh, dispute with the uh, Indian tax authorities, what's the situation, what uh, work are you doing with them to solve the mm. situation? Well, you know, that's um, something that um, has been in existence for over 22 months now. We have done everything we can to resolve the situation. It's been very bad for us. We had to make 40% of our workforce redundant last year. Um, we had to cancel um, investment in certain projects we've been planning. We had to cancel a share buyback um, uh, uh, that we were undertaking. And we had to um, sell some assets. Uh, we, did, we made those tough decisions to ensure that we remained strong to be able to focus on things like Senegal going forward. Nevertheless, it had a damaging effect on us. Moreover, I think it has an extremely damaging effect on India. Uh, you, our shareholding base, like many companies, uh, uh, spreads across the world. 35% of our shareholders are from North America. They see what's going on. They see a company like Cairn, which has been so associated with success in India. You know, our legacy assets there uh, will provide $100 billion of revenue to the government over their life. And we've made material investments and uh, uh, material um, production um, in India. So for that success story to be tarnished by this tax issue, which to us is spurious, it shouldn't be there. Um, we've done everything um, as we should have done it. We've received all the approvals that we should have done. And we don't believe that we should be in this position at all. We've had to result to arbitration to resolve this and our plea if you like to the Indian government is if we can't resolve it in any other way let's commit to arbitration let's do that on a fast track basis and put this behind us. And when are we likely to hear about the outcome of uh, this process? Well I, I think you know the, uh, that is a matter that we'll, we'll just report back when there is a material development. Uh, so we appointed an arbitrator the Indian government have confirmed publicly that they have now appointed an arbitrator following our interventions um, um, uh, hopefully, therefore, that will allow the arbitration to proceed quickly to resolve this uh, for everybody's benefit so that you know, what we think is a tarnished image of investment in India can be improved. Now, Simon, earlier you mentioned your work with partners. Mm. Um, is there a need for further collaboration uh, in the current environment? Yes, um, I would say that um, the yes is qualified in the sense that um, it's more than just the word collaboration in my mind. There needs to be solid action behind that. I think um, the industry um, prides itself on having strong partnerships. When you think about joint ventures around the world, 
Mm, you know, the people were with, for example, Senegal, par our partners FAR, our partners Conoco, our partners the government. The industry can collaborate well in that environment. What's perhaps been less successful, again through cyclical timing, has been the collaboration between the industry in terms of the upstream explorers and uh, the service providers. Uh, and I think what we're seeing now is the disconnect that we've seen before, um, where you know costs are coming down, um, everybody's slashing budgets, and there's a kind of domino effect, if you like, in terms of the hardships that causes. If there's any lesson that we need to learn from this going forward is that um, you know both entities, in terms of services and, and upstream companies, need to collaborate in the strength in the sense of actually doing something about it a factual collaboration which may involve um, a degree of um, not just um, uh, words but actual physical interaction in some form it's been difficult it's been very difficult for people have tried it in the past but until that happens i fear that we'll have the same cyclical effects that we've had before but i think you know we should all focus on trying to collaborate as much as we can and uh, is the world oil and gas week a good place to find potential collaborators and partners? Yes, you know I think it, it actually this morning was very interesting um, discussion before the panel that I was on in relation to the effect of uh, costs. The, the uh, there were some challenging questions in relation to collaborations and partnerships and some very good answers. And I think you know to get everybody in the room together, you know whether it's oil companies, whether it's government representatives, whether it's service providers and so on. And, and stimulate those kinds of discussions, things can come out of that. So um, I very much enjoy it. We've been attending for a number of years and it's always been a good experience for us. Fantastic. Simon, thank you very much. Not at all. Thank you. Simon Thompson, Chief Executive Officer at Cairn Energy.